Good morning, everybody. I would like to thank the ELPA for inviting me to give a topic. I will talk about the management of cartilage injuries of elite basketball players. My name is Dr. Guy Morag, and I'm the team physician of head of Maccabi Tel Aviv. And I work as a head of the sports unit in the orthopedic division in Tel Aviv Medical Center. I have no disclosures about this topic, and we will start. So the cartilage, as an introduction, in the joint cartilage distributes the loads of the articulation, thereby minimizing the peak stress acting on the subcondyl bone. We look at the picture and we see that the tensile strength of the tissue maintains its structural integrity under loading, it changes and its elastics. Since cartilage doesn't have any nerves and blood vessels, Damage limited to the cartilage alone is not likely to be detected at the time of injury. Usually we see it when it starts hurting the bone. In this case, cartilage may become fatigue and it fails more easily when subjected to acute or repetitive trauma. If we see, we divide the cartilage defects. We have a classifications. The easier one is one to four. It was invented by Outer Ridge in 1960. Where is one is only softening of the cartilage, and then it goes with fragmentations and feathering and to a full thickness cartilage defect, as we see in the pictures. That's a grade four. And then there is a bone exposed. For the etiology, the cartilage defects in 63% of neotroscopies, we see chondral lesions. 20% of the neotroscopies reveal chondral lesions with full thickness. Of this, 5% are less than 40 years old. This is in the normal populations. 43% are partial sickness, and 65% are accompanying meniscal or ligamentous lesions. Articular cartilage, as we said, is an avascular tissue incapable of self-repair. If it is untreated, it will go on and progress to a degenerated uh, joint and arthritic changes. Brian Cole did, uh, did an article in 2008 when he took all his NBA players and the Chicago Bulls and did MRI to see for asymptomatic players. He saw that in 28 knees, that most were asymptomatic, there were 7% focal defect, 25% had subchondral edema, and 50% had some kind of chondromalacia or abnormal signal. Most of them were in the patellofemoral joint, and some of them in the medial femoral condyle and lateral femoral condyle, as we see. So we chose us that actually even asymptomatic players will come with some changes along with time. In arthroscopy 2012, Brophy showed full thickness near articular cartilage defects in National Football League combined athletes. Combined athletes like the draft for the NFL. He took 704 MRI scans in 575 players. That's about a third of the players. Most were asymptomatic, and he showed again 70% full thickness defect. 58% were lateral compartment, mostly lateral femoral condyles, and were associated probably with previous menisectomy. In 2008, in a paper in a troscopy from Matthew Provencher, Symptomatic focal knee defects in NFL players are associated with poor performance and less volume of play. He showed us that 4.4% chondral injuries without prior injuries, but telofemoral was most common. And we saw that these players were picked later, played fewer games, and less, less minute played. What showed us actually that even asymptomatic players that we take and we see along with time develop frontal damage, cartilage damage, and it can actually um, tell us about the, the, the next or the upcoming uh, uh, games that we, they will play. For the etiology of cartilage defect, it can be atraumatic and it can be chronic. Atraumatic, traumatic can be through the, due to dislocations, ligamentous and meniscus injuries, or just contusions, 
chronic is the cause of shear uh, injuries that we see. So what do we take from this and how do we decide how to treat them? We do not treat MRI. Remember, if patient, if we do an MRI players and they have some kind of lesions, we do not treat it if they are asymptomatic. We look at the performance. Does a player can perform or not? Is performance maintained, impaired, is he uh, able to play or isn't he not? We look at it, is it an acute onset, a contusion, some kind of a ligamentous injury with cartilage injury, or is it a chronic onset? Actually, a pain that comes slowly, gets more and more, sometimes effusions, and then we decide what to do. Non-operative is usually the vast majority of the, of the cases, and we have to see, do we want to operate or not? Timing of the lesion, timing of the diagnosis, it's very important. And this is the thing we have to talk about when we treat elite basketball players. Timing, is it the end of beginning of contract? This is an issue that as a, as a treating physician, I do not need to deal with, but I have to think, and the management and the player and the agent, everybody has to think around this case. Is it begin mid end of season or is it before final four championship games that we can let the player go on with the injury without causing irreversible changes? What are our options for treatment? We are dealing with between non-operative and operative in every orthopedic case. Non-operative can be physiotherapy, injections, and we will talk about injections in a minute. Oxygen, oxygen chamber is questionable in some bone edema or some uh, chondral uh, damages, it was mentioned, or operative. There are a few, case, a few uh, options to operate a cartilage lesion. When we treat uh, cartilage non-operative, we're thinking about chondral facilitation and chondral protection. We want to protect, we want to regenerate the cartilage, and we want actually to help um, and maintain the, the, the cartilage as a good barrier to the bone. So we are talking about injection, we're talking about hyaluronic acid, PRP, which is platelet-rich plasma, autokine, or stem cells. What is hyaluronic acid? Hyaluronic acid is a synthetic acid that we inject in the, uh, to the knee. Biomechanical, it works as a shock absorption and lubrication. But it has, it has a therapeutic response. It can it decrease inflammatory response and improve the viscous elastic properties. It can protect the cartilage, that generation can have a meniscectomy. This is questionable, but it shows we have papers that do support it, and it can enhance the synthesis of glycosaminoglycans. It will not give us new cartilage, it will not repair a full thickness tear to a hyaline good cartilage, but it, it can help uh, cartilage degeneration prevention. PRP, PRP is platelet-rich plasma. It's a plasma we take blood from the patient and we put it in the centrifuge and then after um, five to 10 minutes, we have some kind of amount of plasma with 1,507, 1,507 unique proteins with growth factors. The growth factors have positive effect on cartilage metabolism and regeneration. It shows major efficacy in several studies, and it's better than hyaluronic acid in arthritic patients in function and pain. We are talking about basketball players. Those are not arthritic patients, but we have the good uh, evidence that it can help cartilage changes. Autokine is an anti-interleukin 1RA that was developed in Germany. It shows very good improvement in osteoarthritis, but it may be not good as PRP for cartilage lesion, for focal cartilage lesion. Everybody says they want what Kobe Bryant got, but it is mostly for osteoarthritis. So if we think about the injection we have, what is the ideal combination? And there are some paper to support it. One paper from 2015 for American Journal of Sports Medicine from Yosoka, it showed a stimulation of the superficial zone protein 
and lubrication in the articular cartilage by human PRP. Showed us actually the development of some proteins that can help and uh, prevent the, the degeneration of the joint. Another paper in 2016 showed that hyaluronic acid induces the release of growth factors from PRP, from platelet-rich plasma. And in biomaterials 2015, we, we saw the papers from Wei Hong Chen that showed that there is a synergism between the actions of hyaluronic acid, acid, and PRP on cartilage regeneration and osteoarthritis therapy. So my point of view and my ideal combination is PRP and hyaluronic acid. And in the upcoming, um, upcoming presentation, I will show you what I do. So when we have, we talked about non-operative, but who and when do we operate? For non-operative, we take the patient with acute onset that maintain performance. Patients that we can, players that we can help them with injections, physiotherapy. But if the non-operative treatment fails, we go to operative. So there are players who are with impaired performance, recurrent effusion, they're not able to perform well and to go back to the game. They have time to rehab because we have to think, think that if we operate, we need a lot of time for rehabilitation and we will talk about it. So they have to have a long contract or they are young. Unacceptable pain, and we always have to consider the benefit versus risk. There is no orthopedic uh, surgery that gives us 100% success. But most important is the manage patient expectations. Cartilage surgery, and I took it from another lecture, is not an on-off switch. We don't operate cartilage and we put the player back in on and he will not have any problems anymore. It's more like a dimmer. It gets better and sometimes it can get a bit uh, worse. It can, you can have effects and pain and some recurrent effusions, but we have to manage the expectation and to explain that it will it is not a one-time surgery or a one or and surgery that will help immediately and you won't have any problems again. I usually say that the patient with cardiac surgery becomes a, an orthopedic patient all, all his life. What are the options? We talked about surgical treatment of convolutions. So our, we have a few groups. The first group is arthroscopic lavage and depriving, which is actually um, a, sim a simple procedure that some of the cases are good for it. Then we have the marrow stimulating techniques, the abrasive chondroplasty or the drilling and microfractures, and the transplantation techniques, which we'll go through. Arthroscopic lavage and debridement are procedures that are used for pain relief, actually for small procedures. You only clean the area that was damaged. It has to support to have a support of a good cartilage lesion of a good cartilage border that will support the area that you debrided. The symptoms improvement is usually temporary unless it is a very small one. I also I usually look at it as a tire that goes on a pothole. If the pothole is small enough, the tire will go on it. Actually. Um, supporting itself by the good borders around. There is no solid evidence of any biological or hyperactivity in arthroscopic lavage. The next step is marrow stimulation techniques, microfracture drilling and abrasion, which is actually, I think, was the most done procedure in the fewer decade, and now we are a bit moving from it, but it's still a very good procedure. The convolution is exposed to the bone, mar is the bone marrow by removing the lower calcified layer of cartilage, and it's aimed in forming blood clots that in turn will induce fibrous tissue production that promotes cartilage regeneration, but we have fibrocartilage and not hyaline cartilage, which is the cartilage that we are born with. It looks like this. You see the hole, you see there is a space special howl, all that we make holes with it, or we can take a drill, a small drill, and that makes the, the holes in the subchondral bone to, uh, 
to grow up mesenchymal cells for fibrocartilage. The results of microcartilage, the first paper that was from uh, Richard Stedman and was published about patients that was retrospectively selected from a large group and in relative small chondral defects, means size of 2.8 centimeters. At seven years, 80% of the patients rated themselves good. Patient aged less than 35 years old were improved more than older people. The next paper was in a 25 NFL American football players and reported 76% of players returned to the sports level by next season. But we have to see that 36% actually started to reduce after a follow-up of 4.5 years. The next option we have is transplantation. In transplantation, we can transplant cartilage from the patient itself or from a cadaver. Autologous osteochondral transplantation is taking a plug, a bone plug, a cartilage and bone plug from a non-weight bearing area in the knee and implanting it in the lesion area, which can take one, two, three, it depends how big it is. Hangodi was the one who published it. There is a paper from Bobich that was published in 2000. It showed that one to four centimeters square full thickness chondral defect in a weight bearing area. The indication, the ideal indication, is a full thickness defect with stable surrounding cartilage. Hangodi showed us in 2003, which is the largest single series of mosaic dusty to date. And he took about 750 uh, patients up to 10 years post hoc they were followed up and showed good to excellent results in 92% in femoral condyles, 87% tibial plateau and 79% in patellofemoral joints. The other option is to take fresh osteochondral allograft. Fresh grafts are not available over everywhere, but it's a possibility and this is a, actually uh, an indication for very large lesions, more than three square, square centimeters, which other procedure may be inadequate. The chondral defect usually, if it has a subchondral bone defect as well, it is also a good indication. The treatment is most successful in unicompartmental defects. This is the indications for all the people less than 60 years old, specific condition of also converted disaccounts of post-traumatic defects, but it's a contraindicated in severe degenerative changes in the articular surface. Fresh osteochondral allograft, we take, as I say, from a cadaver, and a paper from Gazavi in, in 1997, which was one of the first in post-traumatic osteochondral lesions, showed us 95% successful results at five years, 66% at 20 years, 14% failure defined as decrease in his score, but these were not players. If we are talking about players, so fresh, fresh osteochondral allograft showed us survival rates as 95% at five years, 80% at 10 years, and 65% at 50 years, but again, not players, all the people. I will show you later papers about players. ACI is cartilage implantation, which we take cartilage from the patient, we take it to the lab, and then after three, four weeks, we transplant it in the damaged area. It was performed first by Peterson in 1987, and it was initially applied in clinical practice in 1994. Here we see the picture, we take cartilage, we take it to the lab, we isolate it, and then we bring it back and do an arthrotomy open. We harvest periost to close the lesion and inject the cartilage cells. ACI was published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine in 2010 by Lars Peterson and, sh and showed us actually for grade um, three and four, patient age 15 to 55, big lesions and showed us um, and 74% of the patients reported the status as better, the same as previous years. There were 92% who were satisfied and would have the ACI again. 
but there is no evidence for whether the cells produce extracellular matrix. We are not sure this is highly cartilage. And actually, in other studies, we, we saw that this is a highly like cartilage. So first generation ACI is good, but not good enough. And we developed the MACI. MACI is a matrix induced autologous nodocyte implantation. The same process as before, we take the cartilage cells and we send it to the lab, but then we process it in a, in a scaffold and we bring it back and transplant the scaffold uh, on the lesion. We do not have to suture a periost on it. We don't have to do anything more. This is a case that uh, we had uh, with a trochlea in the lateral later trochlea lesion. And we see it after six months, uh, how it looks very nice with the cartilage heals. Results in basketball players, because we are talking about basketball players. So we have a few papers of all the cartilage uh, options that I actually presented. And this is a patient from American Journal of Sports Medicine, 2009, by uh, Brian Sennett, um, which showed us results and performance after microfracture in NBA, in National Basketball Association Atlas, 24. Uh, NBA players, who, which underwent between 1997 and 2006 the procedure. 33% of NBA athletes who underwent microfracture never returned to play. 14% returned to play in the NBA association for more than one season. Within group com comparison, we see that points scored and minutes played were reduced. But if we take it to variables for 40 minutes, so no significant difference or average over 40 minutes of play. Kai Nithofer with Riley Williams showed us actually high impact athletics after knee articular cartilage repair that prospective evaluation of microfracture which was actually presented in 2006. It took 32 athletes, competitive and recreational participation. 66% reported good and excellent results. 57% thought they got into their pre-operative performance level, which is pretty good. But they noted that return to sport was significantly higher in athletes with lower age, young, low, small size, less than two square centimeters, pre-operative symptoms less than one year, and no prior surgical intervention, which is very important. If we take a paper from 2018 from Riley Williams that actually was talking about osteochondral allograft transplantation of full sequence cartilage defect in NBA pairs. This is a small paper, but a very important one. About 11 athletes, four professional, seven collegiate, 14 treated lesions, but the main lesion, look at it, was very big. It was more than five square centimeters. All patients underwent osteochondral allograft with an autotomy and fresh graft. Not frozen graft, fresh graft. The overall rate of return to play at the same level was 80%. The median time per, to get back to play was 14 months, which is actually much longer than other options. Among players with available statistics, there was no significant reduction in any performance category. I took a paper from cartilage, activity-related outcomes of particular cartilage surgery, systematic review, actually, of all the cartilage options from Brian Cole, and he took ACI, oats, microfraction. There were a lot of uh, scores tested, IKDC, technolition course, and the return to sports outcome were earlier return to competition with microfracture than ACI. 6 to 6.5 to 8 months in comparison to one year or more. Deteri but there are deterioration of IGDC in Tegnoscope beyond two years, whereas ACI remains stable. The overall rate to professional soccer is equal between microfracture and ACI. Overall return to play to competitive soccer and basketball was most in OATS, in osteochondral autologous transfer. The reoperation was significantly higher in ACI. So we see there's a lot of uh, systems. How do we 
decide what to do with the patients. Depends where the lesion is, femoral condyle or patellofemoral. Lesion size. In one paper, you will see two to three centimeter, high demand and low demand. In other papers, you will see if there is malalignment or not. This is from Brian Cole. The other one is from Gomoli, a treatment of algorithm for cartilage repair. And again, small is two centimeters. Bigger is more than four centimeters. So there's a few algorithm and everyone has to take from his knowledge and his experience what the best for him is. For summary, for small convex defects, less than three centimeters square, the options are microfracture, mosaic plasty, or to ACI. Today, there is no solid evidence of advantage in terms of outcome of one method. In patients with high demand, microfracture is less favorable. For defects more than three centimeters, mosaic plasty and microfracture are less favorable, allografts and Macy as the main treatment options. We have to remember that microfracture does fibrocartilage, or the other options can give us hyaline like cartilage, which is probably a bit better. Microfracture treatment for acute defects like contusion or small defects, if there is no flap or free body, I wait till the knee cools down. Physio and injections. I use hyaluronic acid and PRP injection, three injections once a week. We turn to play, I let my players play, go back when they have full range of motion. No effusion, good quadriceps strength, and good function, functional tests. We test, I don't do MRI for each patient, but I follow them very, I follow them very strict. For chronic defects or fat conservative treatment, one to two centimeters, not more than that, I do microfractures and injection postoperative. For two centimeters and more, I do OATS, Osteochondral Autologous Transfer System. Macy was done in the past in Israel, but it's not available anymore in Israel. Fresh allograft, it's not available in Israel. In the States, fresh allograft is very common. But for bigger lesion, more than three centimeters, I would send for a fresh allograft, osteochondral fresh allograft. We we'll take home message: treating cartilage lesion and payload medicine. It depends the age of the player. It depends what the time from injury. Is it acute, chronic? Does he have symptoms for three years or less than one year? It depends where the area of the, the lesion. Trochlea that's better than condyles. In trochlea. We can do microfracture and reactions, and you have a very good border with good cartilage uh, surrounding. We can do the brightness or microfracture. If it's a very big lesion, we would look for a transplantation. Position of pair is very important. Guard versus center. I mean BMI. It gives us better results or low weight and height. Genetic factors is questionable but alignment is very important. We will not make a cartilage surgery without alignment, uh, without alignment repair if the area of the cartilage rhythm will be uploaded. We have to unload or at least leave it as is um, when we repair a cartilage. Rehabilitation, we did not talk about it, I believe whether we will be talk about it, but the rehabilitation after surgery is the most important. It's not less important than the technicality of the surgery. In cartilage surgery, we do six weeks non-weight bearing, and we let running only after five to six months, only if the quadriceps is very strong and, and the functional tests are good. All the rest we do with hydrotherapy, working in the gym, and working with the physiotherapist and the athletic trainer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again for inviting me and see you soon in Tel Aviv.